can't get minister done in her fast enough, right? You can't renovate when there's something in there. Yeah. Alright, I'll ask you. Yeah, I know, like, there's candles and it looks like you can pull them, but... Yeah. But I didn't, like, I was yanking on it and I was like, I don't want to break this thing, so I'm just going to not open them, but... It gets kind of warm in there sometimes. Well, I know, but then the other offices are too cold, so it's a bit of a trade-off, right? What's that?
Good morning, Riverside United Church. Good morning. Welcome again to worship today. And I said, I think, last week, worship wouldn't be the same without all of you. So thank you again for joining us for worship this morning. I am your, uh, your minister, your reverend, your pastor, uh, your, not your dad, but his dad anyways. Um, not a grandparent yet, but God forbid one day one of my five kids will have grandchildren for us to enjoy, and then we get to have all the fun without all the responsibilities. That's what grandparenting is all about, right? The payment for all those years of turmoil, of raising your own children, and then you get to have all the fun with the grandchildren. But welcome to worship today. So glad that you're all here joining us, and a special welcome to our online viewers as well as we're uh, streaming and recording online. And if you are feeling comfortable, are we ready up there, guys? Yeah? Give, turn around, give the camera a little wave, say hello to our online viewers this morning as they welcome us or welcome them to worship as well, and they welcome us into their homes. Like, that's a whole other level than here. Thank you, Lucas. And thank you, Lucas, for the camera work as always. Yes, thank you. So we're going to sing a song, and it's a song that was a former song of the month in, I think, November. I was told November this morning, so hopefully you remember it a little bit because we sang it a few times. It's called The King of Love, and we'd invite you to please stand as you're able and join us in singing.
as we cut. If that doesn't get you excited for Sunday morning, I don't know what will. Let us pray our opening prayer, which will include our Lord's Prayer as well. So please uh, pray with me as appropriate. Let us pray. God, you are the king of love and our shepherd you are, Lord. Help us this morning, God, to recognize the love that you have for us and the love that you have for everybody around us as well, God. That you're not just shepherding our physical bodies but our inward spiritual souls as well, God. That you are shepherding us towards good things, positive things, things that will Lift us up, God, and lift up others and not tear them down. So send us your Holy Spirit, Lord, this morning that we may shepherd others in the good news that is this gospel of Jesus Christ, this good news that we believe in, that we preach, that we have faith in God and hope in because of your grace for us, God, this never-ending grace for us, Lord. May those waves of grace this morning, God, wash over us as we talk about cultivating a culture of grace here in this church this morning and therefore cultivating a culture of grace in the culture around us as well, God. And in his life, Lord Jesus taught us so, so many things. And one thing, Jesus taught us how to pray. And so we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So today we have week four of our uh, current sermon series, Harmony Amidst Strife, Navigating Conflict. And over the last three weeks, we've talked about the power of forgiveness. We've talked about recognizing the storms of conflict, but then how to navigate those storms as well. And last week was all about bridging the gaps that may exist between not only us and others, but us and God as well. In today's message, we turn our focus to a portion of... There's two letters of Paul we're going to read. Two portions of two different letters that Paul wrote. One to the church in Philippi and one to the church in Colossae. And our topic is cultivating a culture of grace. Any of you farmers or know any farmers? I know a lot of farmers. My former charge was filled with farmers. So you know what a cultivator is and what it does. Any gardeners out there will know. So we're going to cultivate that here this morning and talk about cultivating a culture of grace. For now though, we have our current song of the month to sing uh, from our More Voices hymn book, which isn't in your pews, but it's a United Church hymn book. It's called Are You a Shepherd? So this is, I think, our second or third time singing it as a congregation. So maybe some of you, if you've been here a few weeks, you're getting to know the song a little bit better and you're enjoying it. You like the message a little bit more. You know when you, to start and stop singing. But if you don't, just sing joyfully anyways. Make a joyful noise this morning as we celebrate uh, the Lord today on, on Sunday. And so please uh, stand as you're able and join us in singing, Are You a Shepherd? <laughs>
be seated as we come into our time for the uh, young at heart. If there's anybody that's feeling young at heart this morning, I'd invite you to come forward. That usually includes children, but it can include non-children as well. I only see Micah though this morning down here. Are you going to help? We got to bring some offering plates up there, Micah. What do you think? No? Come on. For those of you that don't know, this is my middle child. I'm not just grabbing strange children that don't belong to me. <laughs> we got to get some offering plates, though, and bring them to the front. I don't have much help today, but that's all right. It'll just take a little bit longer, so we'll practice patience today. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. And so we bring our offering forward as a sign and symbol of presenting it to God, the things that we give to the church for all the things that God gives to us, just a small token of our appreciation. And we do uh, always accept all donations. If you're looking to give, just let us know, and we can get you hooked up with many different ways to uh, donate to the church and the mission of the church and the mission of God as a whole as well. So we are talking about cultivating a culture of grace this morning. Micah doesn't know what a tractor is yet, but a tractor, if you don't know, if you don't know farmers, they get a big tractor that's this huge vehicle and it pulls behind it a machine. And the machine doesn't really move except that it toils all the dirt up. It, it mixes it all around. It cultivates the soil so that they can plant something in it. Now what did they plant in it? A seed maybe? Around here probably soybeans or corn, maybe tomato, um, wheat, yeah winter wheat, that might be coming up right about now actually. They might be harvesting wheat in the near future depending on the location of their farm. Um, so they cultivate the soil so that they can plant things in it. It gets rid of all the dead stuff and, and then that dead stuff goes back into the soil so that plants can grow and other things can grow. So that's what cultivating does. It help, it's the beginning stage of growing something. So we're talking about cultivating a culture of grace because we want to begin cultivating something here in the church that then we can plant a seed in it. We cultivate the people and the dirt around us, this community, and we can plant something in there. And then we can water it and take care of it. And then it sprouts. And then there'll be something to harvest eventually as we take more care of it. Jesus told a parable about planting seeds and just scattering them everywhere, right? Some lands on good soil, some lands on bad soil, some lands with weeds and things that drown it out. And it's a parable about like what we do in our lives, or partly anyways, it's a parable, what we do in our lives will be who we are, what we become, what we water will be what we grow. What we give to others will be what we harvest from them, and vice versa, hopefully. So Micah will learn all about cultivators one day, eh bud? All right, we're going to say a prayer, and then I guess he can head downstairs. And if you want to head down to Sunday school too, you're more than welcome to as well. There's no age limit to Sunday school after all, but there's no age limit up here either. So let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for cultivators and for plants and for seeds and for all the things that help us grow and become healthy people, Lord, seeking to follow your will and your way in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the offering that's been offered to you this morning and brought forward. And we just pray, Lord, that you will use everything that we've given to the benefit of, of not only this church, but the community around this church, Lord, that we may know your love and spread it to all around us. And we do pray all this, Lord, and so much more in the name of Christ our Lord. And everybody said? Amen. Oh, man, I think Micah wants to take the microphone, but maybe one day. Maybe one day he'll continue that Gilliland family line of ministry. There's a few of us, if you don't know. I have grandparents and a dad who are ministers, so it's in his blood, as they might say. Uh, choir song, right? Yeah, I'll turn it over to the choir for our choir anthem this morning, so enjoy.
Thank you, thank you choir so much. And Carol already on the way up to read our scripture reading, our first reading this morning from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, verses 21 to 30. The only important thing about living is Christ, and dying would be profit for me. If I continue living in my body, I will be able to work for the Lord. I do not know what to choose, living or dying. It is hard to choose between the two. I want to leave this life and be with Christ, which is much better. But you need me here in my body. Since I am sure of this, I know I will stay with you to help you grow and have joy in your faith. You will be very happy in Christ Jesus when I am with you again. Only one thing concerns me. Be sure that you live in a way that brings honor to the good news of Christ. Then, whether I come and visit you or am away from you, I will hear that you are standing strong with one purpose, that you work together as one for the faith of the good news, and that you are not afraid of those who are against you. All of this is proof that your enemies will be destroyed, but that you will be saved by God. God gave you the honor not only of believing in Christ, but also of suffering for him, both of which bring glory to Christ. When I was with you, you saw the struggles I had, and you hear about the struggles I am having now. You yourselves are having the same kind of struggles. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy word. Thank you so much, Carol, for that. So every church, every organization, every group comes with a type of culture that will make up what that group is, what it does, who they are, who they aren't, so on and so forth. And in pretty well all instances, that culture is built by those who came before the people currently there. So for us here, that's Riverside United Church. We are a, a church that's a group of people. We gather together for a purpose, right? To worship God, to learn about God's word, to hopefully help the community, to grow in faith. Like There's a million different reasons that we might come to church and come to this specific church. But none of us, I don't think, began the culture here, right? Just over 95 years ago, almost, sorry, 95 years ago, the culture was begun by people before us. We've inherited the culture that they started and then they continued and we've continued that culture likely in some ways and in others you've likely changed the culture that came before you because of various things that happened or didn't happen or this, that and the other thing. And if I was to ask every single one of you at a personal level, what is the culture of Riverside United Church? you'd probably all give me a different answer. Because <laughs> our viewpoint on what the culture is will be affected by our experiences with that culture. Will be affected by how involved we are in the culture. It will be affected by each different minister that has come along and which minister happens to be in the pulpit at the moment I ask that question. And it's likely the minister will change the culture in various different ways. I know I have. I, I have no doubt about that. And other, every other minister before me came and they brought their own sways, their own personality, their own things to the church. And so they changed the culture a little bit as well. And when a minister decides to leave a church, it begins what we call a search process. Here's a bit of church kind of background information for you this morning. This is a process in the United Church of Canada where if I was to say, well, I'm leaving in six months, I took another call somewhere else. That would begin a search process, which there was, I think, what, 12 people or so, Dan, on that committee? 11 or 12 people on the search committee that Riverside began when Frank, Reverend Frank Staples, said he was leaving to go to another church. And so it begins this search process. And part of that process is a lot of paperwork, right? Is it a lot of paperwork? A few of them, the ones that were involved. Yeah, it's a lot of paperwork. And I know it's a lot of paperwork because that's my, that was my first introduction to who Riverside is. 
The first thing I saw for Riverside was these four or five documents that your search committee, I assume, put together that helps me to understand who you are as a church, the things you enjoy, the things you like, your demographics, everything about Riverside that you can fit into four or five pages. They fit into those four or five pages. <coughs> and so a big reason for those documents is to give perspective new ministers, i.e. me at th that point in time, an idea into who you are, who you see yourselves as. What does Riverside United Church say about themselves? What do you say about the culture here at Riverside United Church? And these documents in essence help me to understand the culture a little bit more. It helped me to understand what's important to the people, what kinds of jobs that people have outside of the church community, like whether you work automotive industry or nursing or healthcare or food or whatever it might be, uh, what age demographics, so much more. And I has, had to ask Dan for those documents this week because I wanted to review them again for today's sermon. So thank you, Dan McCulloch, for sending me those documents this week. And so today's message will be a little bit different stylistically than I think I've ever done here in the past. Not totally different, there'll be a lot of similarities, but you might notice little quirks here that are different than past messages, and that's okay. So what did these documents tell me about Riverside? Even before I had an initial interview with Riverside, I hadn't met a single person. What did these documents tell me that I thought, hey, I'm going to send them my information and see if they're interested in me? So one question the document asks is this. Oh, not on the screen yet, sorry. Ignore that, we'll get to that. One question the document asks is how does the church view itself? And it gives six possible answers. I'm only going to list three for our purposes today. Because six is an awful lot. Riverside checked one of the three though for the record that I'm going to tell you. Those who made up the search team might recognize these so refrain from shouting out anything about the correct answer. But these are the three options that we're going to consider today. So how does Riverside view itself and its mission? Well, we're, we are clear about our vision and purpose. We have the skills, gifts, and confidence to move toward our vision. So we have a clear vision and purpose, and we know exactly how to get there. Number two, we know we are changing. We haven't yet come to terms with it. We have some anxiety about the future, but we are still confident in who we are. So there's changes happening, we don't know what that means, and so we're a little bit anxious about that. But we're confident that we're still going to be a church body. And then the third option I've chosen this morning. Our congregation is changing rapidly, and it is clear that we can no longer continue as we have been. We don't know, though, how to go forward, so we have, again, some anxiety. We believe that we have a future, but we can't yet see it. So option two, basically, you see a future, you're just not sure how to get there. Option three is, we think we have a future, but we're honestly not even sure. Which one of those do you think Riverside checked? And likely, if I asked all of you and showed you all six, all of you would give me one of six different answers based on, again, your experiences of the culture here. Which one do you think, I'll give you the answer, but which one do you think is the most appropriate for your understanding of Riverside United Church and your experience here is at number one, two, or three. You are allowed to shout out, by the way. That's okay. <laughs> number two, you think number two is most appropriate? Number three, a few threes out there? Any ones out there? A couple ones and a hand or two up? So here's what Riverside checked. We think of our community of faith in the following way. We know we are changing. We haven't yet come to terms with it. We have some anxiety about the future, but we are still confident in who we are. So that was option two, by the way. I think I heard Cliff shout two from upstairs, and he was on the search team, so he might have remembered that. He didn't listen to the first instruction. <laughs> Don't shout out if you're part of the search team. <laughs> but you see, that answer is important, isn't it? We know we are changing. We haven't yet come to terms with those changes yet. So we're anxious for the future. But despite that anxiousness, we are still confident in who we are. Very good things to know. And there are many things that we can do when we're anxious about something. We'll get to that in a second too. 
There are many things we can do when we're anxious about something. When we're anxious about the future, but we still see a future, and a, hopefully a good one, a positive one at that. There are things we can do. In the letter to the Philippians, which Carol just read a few moments ago, Paul tells the church that there's only one thing that concerns him. One thing that concerns Paul in his ministry to the church in Philippi. And he says it is this, that the church be sure to live in a way that brings honor to the good news of Christ. So everything else that you do as a church, make sure you bring honor to the good news of Jesus Christ. Bring honor to the things that you believe. Similar to last week from what we read from Paul, where he said it's okay to be angry, but it's not okay to sin when you're angry. If you're angry, that's okay, but don't hurt others in the process of your anger. We might change that a little bit for this morning and say it's okay to be an anxious church but make sure you never stop living in a way that brings honor to the good news that you believe in to the honor in Jesus Christ when you're anxious don't forget about Jesus let Jesus take on that anxiety with you he's with you through the storm we found that out with Peter in the storm a couple weeks ago and then Paul says this at verse 30. <clears throat> when I was with you, <clears throat> you saw the struggles I had. And you hear about the struggles I am having now. You yourselves are having the same struggles. See how down to earth Paul is in that last little bit there? Something's going on in the Philippian church. that It's suffering in some way from something. Paul writes them this letter while he himself is where? in prison, suffering for something he has done, suffering for his faith, in jail for it. He's awaiting a trial which could result, if he's found guilty, in his death, his execution for the things that he's done and the things he believes. And so Paul's open and honest, he's up front with them about the things going on in his life. You saw the struggles I had, and you hear about the struggles I am having now. You yourselves are having the same struggles. Open, honest, you might call it addressing the issue directly. Something else we talked about a few weeks ago. <clears throat> Paul practices these things in his own ministry. He humbles himself here to the Philippian church. He addresses the issue directly, and he reminds them to never forget about the good news that they believe in, the good news of all that Jesus has done. So how do we lower anxiety in a church? How do we lower the anxiety of we see a future but we don't know exactly what it looks like so we're a little anxious about it? Well, we'd be open and honest with one another. We'd be open and honest about the suffering going on. We'd be open and honest about the conflict that's happening. We'd be open and honest about the things that are causing the anxiety, whatever those things are. And again, for each one of you, that might be a different thing if you're experiencing any anxiety in the first place. But we remind ourselves of the God that we follow and the example that Jesus gave to us. <clears throat> and we're going to read a, the second portion of a different letter of Paul that he wrote to the Colossian church. <clears throat> Chapter 3, verses 12 to 17, and I'll read this in a moment. <clears throat> Paul writes these words. God has chosen you <clears throat> and made you his holy people. He loves you, so you should al always clothe yourselves with mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive each other. If someone does wrong to you, forgive that person because the Lord forgave you. Even more than all this, clothe yourself in love. Love is what holds you all together in perfect unity. Let the peace that Christ gives control your thinking. Because you were all called together in one body to have peace. <clears throat> the church, one body. Jesus, one body. You're all called together to that. <clears throat> so always be thankful. Let the teaching of Christ live in you richly. Use all wisdom to teach and instruct each other by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 
Everything you do or say should be done to obey Jesus your Lord. And in all you do, give thanks to God the Father through Jesus. Something we do every week here. Hopefully we use wisdom to teach and instruct each other. Hopefully some of the things I say have some wisdom to them. Just a little bit sometimes. But we also sing psalms, we sing hymns, we sing spiritual songs that help lift up our souls. I mean, music is uplifting more often than not. It's powerful, a powerful tool we use. Anybody know off the top of your head what the mission statement of Riverside United Church is? <clears throat> I heard, I am hearing the choir kind of muttering it back there. Reaching out in peace, faith, and love. Paul tells the Colossian church to clothe themselves in love because love is what holds them together in perfect unity, to let the peace of Christ control their thinking and to have faith in God. See, peace, faith, and love. Never forget what God has done for, for you. That's what Paul wants the church to do. That's what we ourselves should do. So what kind of culture does Riverside United Church have? What kind of culture has it had in the past that has cultivated the culture of it in the present? And what will we do that will cultivate the culture moving forward into the future? There's something I'm going to share with you this morning, and I found it in my online research. I always, like, run, whenever I research sermons, it includes the internet. Thank good. I don't know how I would ever write a sermon without the internet. I don't know how you did it. Writing a, there's a, a retired minister in, in the crowd. But the internet's a huge tool, a huge help in, in figuring out some of these things and finding answers and picking and choosing kind of what I think and feel is appropriate for a sermon and what isn't. I wrote this sermon two or three times and then deleted it two or three times and then added in the things that I deleted and took away the things that I added. It was one of those weeks of writing a sermon so hopefully this is hitting home with somebody. I'm going to show you one side at a time. It's a chart. Uh, on one side is what... Well, I guess you'll see it. I won't describe it. You'll see it. So you see there, there's two sides. And I'm going to read the, the left side first. So what is Riverside United Church's culture? Is Riverside a church where the leaders appear sordid, the community appears respectable. Meetings must be a polished performance. Identity is found in ministry. Failure is devastating. Actions are driven by duty. Conflict is suppressed or ignored. And the focus is on orthodoxy and behavior, allowing people to think that they are sorted. Is that Riverside United Church? Any of those things line up, you think? Do the leaders appear sorted? Does the community appear respectable? So on and so forth. The other side, I think the top line is missing, but it says the leaders are vulnerable. As opposed to sorted, they're vulnerable. The leaders are vulnerable. The community is messy. Meetings are just one part of community life. Identity is found in Christ. Failure is disappointing, but not devastating. Actions are driven by joy, as opposed to duty. Conflict is addressed in the open, as opposed to suppressed or ignored. And the focus is on the affections of the heart, with a strong view of sin and grace. So which culture have you experienced here at Riverside? Is it more the left side or more the right side? And there's, the left side is your communities of performance, the right side your communities of grace. So what's the church culture been here at Riverside? Has it been one of performance or one of grace? Has it been a church culture where the leaders appear sorted or one where the leaders are vulnerable? Where the community appears respectable or the community is messy. Where meetings must be polished or where meetings are just one part of life. 
Where is your identity found? In ministry or is it found in Christ? Is failure devastating or is it just disappointing? Are actions driven by duty or are they driven by joy? Is conflict suppressed or ignored or is it addressed in the open? And is the focus on orthodoxy and behavior or is it on the affections of the heart? Now ideally, I would argue we should say yes to all of the right side. That is our church. But I know that's not always the case. And I'm sure all of you know that's not always the case. We have to be the cultivators of the culture we want. If we want to be a community of grace, we have to cultivate the things on the right side of that chart. Unless we want to be a, cult a community of performance, then we cultivate the things on the left. The, that resource I found that chart on, it shares seven things a church can do to cultivate a culture of grace. I'm going to tell, talk about six quickly this morning. <clears throat> the first is this. We make connections. You want to cultivate a culture of grace? Make connections with one another. We should make connections with those around us and in doing so we teach grace by doing what? Singing, praying, talking about the cross. We come to church, hopefully a culture of grace, and instead of raising up our defenses and putting on a smile, pretending everything is okay, we can lower our guard. We can come in and we can be open about the things that have harmed us that week, the things that are dragging us down we make those connections and slowly but surely we can become a culture of grace. So make connections with one another. And also with the community around us, I might add. Number two, we welcome the mess. Can life be messy sometimes? Yeah, life can be messy sometimes. Therefore, our church can and perhaps even should also be messy sometimes. Because all of us are coming here with a life outside of the church. We're all coming here with a mess in our lives. Something that is happening or has happened or will happen. That is bringing us down for one reason or another. None of us are perfect yet. We're still striving to be more like Christ. And so we should welcome one another as the mess that we are. We should welcome one another as the people that we are, mess and all. Be open and honest about conflict, problems, and struggles that we're facing. I am Andrew, and sometimes I struggle with pride in talking too much. My wife's laughing about that one. <laughs> Welcome people for who they are in the community and let the Holy Spirit change their hearts. I am so and so and here's my struggle today. What is it? You don't have to shout it out, but that would be awesome if you wanted to. Number three, if we want to cultivate a culture of grace, we have to stop pretending. We should not feel as if we have to pretend to be somebody or something that we're not when we come to the church community. This should be a place for all sorts of believers and all sorts of different folks, no matter where they are at in their life's journey. Whether they've been a Christian and follow of Christ for 80 plus years, or whether they're just in the beginning stages, or whether they're not even sure if they're a Christian or not, but they're interested in the idea. And so they come to learn more. We should not have to pretend to be somebody we're not in the church community. We should be able to be who we are, feel that way. We should not feel that way. And if we do feel that we have to be something we're not, we've become a culture of performance, not a culture of grace. <clears throat> and so if we cultivate a culture of grace, we won't have to pretend. Now that doesn't mean that you go air out your dirty laundry to just everybody, openly all the time. But it means that you tell people that you struggle. You tell everybody, I struggle. But you only tell some what you struggle with. Those that you're closest with in the community. Now I might tell you what I struggle with. You're the community though. That's me being vulnerable. Remember that, that chart. Communities of grace, the leader is vulnerable. There's a reason I share stories that are personal. 
suffering that I've gone through, things that have happened, good and bad. Because that vulnerability, vulnerability, it's a tough word to say on a Sunday morning, isn't it? That vulnerableness helps you to be vulnerable with me if I'm first vulnerable with you. That helps to create and cultivate a culture of grace. So let everybody know you struggle, but only let some know what you struggle with. Number four, stop performing. Each week I get up here, and I hope that all of you realize that this is not a performance. Everything I say and do up here, I do because I care deeply about the things that I say. I care deeply about this ministry that I hope that we're cultivating together. I care deeply about the church and the people and about God. I care deeply about the Bible and helping people grow in faith as I've grown in faith. Because I know it's helped my life in tremendous ways. And I care deeply because I know how much it can help all of you as well. How much it can help the world around us. So I don't get up here to put on a performance. There's a performing part to it because I move my arms, of course, and sometimes I move around a little bit and I look at you like there's a performance aspect, but that's not the point. The point is, I care and I want all of you to care too. So we have to stop performing. And now that doesn't mean we get it right all the time. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to mess it up. The church should be a place where we have permission to fail. Most, uh, most places in our lives, I don't think we have permission to fail. At your job, you will not be looked at kindly by your boss if you fail. The church should be a place where we're given permission to fail with one another because there's a culture of grace there. Okay, well, we failed here. Let's move on and try again. What did we learn from that failure? And it's only a failure, guess what, if you didn't learn anything from it. Most of the best lessons in my life I learned because I failed at something, not because I succeeded at it. The same will probably be true in the church at some level. We will learn more from the things we fail at than the things that we do really well at. So we have to stop performing to cultivate that culture of grace. Number five though, and this is important, we have to give people time to change. How many of you are exactly like Christ and perfect in every way? I didn't think so. Me neither, for the record. And it can be easy to forget, though, that at some point in time, you were the person that maybe stuck your foot in your mouth because you talked quicker than you should have. It can be easy to forget that maybe you were the person who had a short temper, or maybe you were the person who struggled with pride or addiction or tried to micromanage people. It can be easy to forget where you came from and compared to who you are now today on, what is it, April 20-something? 20 21st, I think, today? April 21st, 2024? It can be easy to forget that you weren't always the person you are today. You came from something. You were somebody before, and now you're somebody now. You've changed. It, it may have taken weeks, months, years, decades, a generation, and longer. We need to give people time to change, because it doesn't happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight for me, and it probably won't happen overnight for you. I mean, it could happen overnight, but likely it's taken weeks, months, years, decades. You are still a work in progress. I am still a work in progress. So we have to give people time to change because it's likely not going to happen overnight. And last but not least, number six. <clears throat> we should focus on the heart. Now most of the things that we think others should change or need to change are focused on their outward behavior, their outward appearance, things that they do, 
not the things that they are. Jesus tells us that our behavior comes from where? The heart. If you want to see behavior change, it starts inside. It start, you change behavior by changing a person's heart. Heart first, behavior second. Not behavior first, then heart. We have to start inside at people's hearts. So focus on the heart. Focus on the inside, not the outward behavior. And guess what? And this might be hard for us. None of us can change somebody's heart. Only God has that power. I can't change your hearts, but I can tell you about God and hope that that warms your heart to God. Hope that that makes your heart more moldable to the things that God wants you to know. Me too. I've had a hard heart before. In some ways I probably still do. I can almost promise you that. God changes the heart through the Holy Spirit. So that's where we should focus. Change the heart and then you'll change the behavior. Focus on the heart and in time the rest will fall into place. <clears throat> Excuse me. So those are just a few ways that we can cultivate a culture of grace here at Riverside United Church instead of a culture of performance. But again, it's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. But it starts with us. It starts with me. It starts with your council. It starts with our volunteers. It starts with all of you here this morning, all of those watching online, all of those who aren't here but are sometimes. It starts with us to cultivate the culture of grace here. And when we do that, when we cultivate a culture of grace here at Riverside United Church, I would be willing to put my money down and bet that the anxiety that, you, that we talked about, that, that, I, that the box that Riverside checked, we have some anxiety about the future, but we think we still have one. I'm willing to bet that that anxiety will begin to dissipate. I'm willing to bet that the conflicts that are happening or have happened or will happen become easier to navigate together as a body, as a people united. And so then we can truly begin to live out that mission statement I mentioned just a few moments ago. And we might truly reach out in peace, faith, and love. Let's pray. God, help us, Lord, this morning to commit ourselves to turning this church into one, Lord, where a culture of grace is not only cultivated, God, but a culture where grace is grown and harvested as well, Lord. Help us all, Lord, as people trying to follow Jesus, to be full of grace and forgiveness for others, Lord, as you are full of grace and forgiveness for us. And send us your Holy Spirit, Lord, this morning and, and all times, wherever we might be. That we may be guided by grace, God, to make connections, to welcome the mess, to stop pretending and stop performing. That we may, God, give others time to change and also that we might focus on the heart, Lord. Focus on the heart. That behavior might change because of your love for us, God. And may we let our hearts as well, God, be warmed up and molded and changed by you, Lord. Open up our hearts, God, for your love. Open up our hearts, God, that we may become more like Christ in everything that we do. And we think of all those who are sick and hurting and, har and harm, God, all those in hospitals and long-term care homes. And we lift up in prayer especially Robert and Dorothy and Christine and Lori and Gail and Linda and John and Jeff and Eleonora and Ed. God, may they know your love for them. May they know, God, your grace for them, Lord, that healing may come in whatever capacity, God, it, it can. And may you work wonders and miracles in all of our lives, Lord, 
that our hearts will be changed, that we will be healed and restored and renewed by the things that you've done for us, God, by the cross and what it represents to us. And in all this, Lord, may we never forget Christ our Lord and may we always bring honor to the things that we believe and honor to the good news that Jesus brought. And we do pray all this and so much more, Lord, in the name of Christ our Lord. And everybody said, Amen. So we're going to sing our closing song this morning from our Voices United hymn book. Uh, it's called Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. So please stand as you're able and join us in singing this last hymn. just quickly this morning as always we have an email list and prayer list if you want to be added to either one please let us know faith talk tuesday mornings at 10 a.m we've begun the book of james we'd love to have you join us with that um, new to you sale coming up so check your news for the pews or maybe talk to trudy she probably knows more about that than than most other folks um <clears throat> Because she's the one that's here right now. And you can ask Trudy about that. Uh, Safari Adventure tonight, right? Cliff, Arlene, Gordon, Maggie? Safari Adventure. If you want to see some pictures and stories from their safari to, I assume, Africa, um, then come on out tonight at 7 p.m. to enjoy that presentation. And uh, we do have there, in a few, in about a month or two, month and a half or two, we're not going to be having worship here. There's going to be a worship at Guestwood Camp out in Essex County there. It's, it's a church picnic with all the United Churches basically in, in Windsor, Essex County. And there are sign-up sheets around if you need a ride or you can give somebody a ride so that you can sign up for that and we can coordinate it all here. So if you need a ride or know somebody that does or you can give a ride, let us know. <clears throat> So, and sign that sheet. There's one at the back on the way out. Um, and that's the 23rd of June at 11 a.m. Still a few little while away, but wanted to make sure you're aware of the sign-up sheets for that. Um, I think there's about 300 people at it last year between all the churches. And I wasn't here at that point, but I, I'll be there this year. I don't have room in my car. I have seven seats and seven people. So uh, five of them being young children, of course. Uh, any other announcements or news from the community? Anything I might have missed? Here and nothing. I guess I got them all. That's good for Andrew. It's been wonderful to be able to connect with all of you and worship with all of you this morning. And I do hope you go from this time of worship, wherever you might be, knowing that we in the church love you, knowing that God loves you. So go and serve others. <laughs>